Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if you will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Good morning. Certainly great to see all of you today. Grateful that uh, you've allowed me to be here. Certainly a blessing as far as we begin this gospel meeting together. Thank you for the wonderful invitation. I'm always humbled uh, to be invited to speak to anybody of the Lord's church. And the wonderful blessing that we have is that we're all related through Christ. And that I consider you my brothers and sisters. So I'm grateful to the elders, to John, uh, for allowing me to be here today. And I'm looking forward to a, certainly a wonderful and great week. If you're visiting today and you do have any questions, as John mentioned, concerning uh, what we do for our worship, uh, what we're teaching, please ask us. We're willing to open up the Bible and certainly teach from what God's Word says that you might understand it. But more importantly, that you might come to know it and certainly know Jesus Christ. I want to talk about a very difficult subject this morning. This week we're going to be talking about encounters with Jesus and how we come to know Jesus first and foremost, but also as Christians we have encounters as well. That is, we sometimes can fall short of God's glory. That means we can make mistakes. But we're also blessed because as Christians we can come back into the light and that we can be forgiven of our sins and transgressions. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Kind of like the windshield wiper effect. And the blessing that we have in knowing that if I make a mistake, that I can be reconciled to God. The only way in which I can be reconciled to God is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, wherefore we are reconciled by the death of Christ to God. So the only way that we can come into the presence of God is because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see, God is a just and loving God. The world sometimes only wants to see the soft loving side of God, but Romans 11 and verse 22 says, behold the goodness and the severity of God. You see, when we think about the character of God, God is a loving and certainly a forgiving God based upon repentance from the standpoint in which we approach God asking Him to forgive us. God offers us the chance to be forgiven because of what He did at Calvary. Again, Romans 5 and verse 8, that God demonstrated, or in my version, the King James Version says, commended His love towards us and that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so because God wants us to have a relationship with Him, but we also have to understand what it means to approach Him. It's based upon our response to the forgiveness offer that we might be reconciled to Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. But unfortunately, the world sometimes sees God in a different light. Unfortunately, the world sometimes views God as this big old softy as a grandparent, right? Now, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, I'm pretty sure that there are several grandparents in this room, right? Shake your head like this. Yes, I know, I know. And if I were to ask you to show me a picture, I would never get out of this building, right? Shake your head like this. They say that grandchildren are God's gift to you for not killing your own children. But the problem is, is that the world looks at God as this grandfather, this softy, because you know as a grandparent that your grandchildren get away with a lot more than your children did, right? Right? I know that mine do sometimes. You see that we get spoiled. It was the same way with my grandparents that I think at that point maybe just grandparents are tired, right? But when we think about it from the standpoint and the way that the world kind of views God sometimes, they view Him as this big old soft grandfather. As if He's just going to forgive every transgression that you do against Him and that forgiveness never has to be reconciled. Brethren, again, Romans eleven twenty two says, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Because... Jesus Christ had to die on the cross for us. God's wrath has to be appeased through His blood. The only thing that cools the wrath of God is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what reconciles us to God. Forgiveness is the first step. Reconciliation is the process. When we think about the idea of forgiveness as it relates to us, it's a very difficult thing. 
If it weren't such a difficult thing, Jesus would not have talked about it. Even going all the way back to Matthew chapter 5 in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, as he's sitting there in the Sermon on the Mount from the very beginning standpoint, he talks about the idea and the importance of what forgiveness is. Because in verse 24, he says, If you have ought against a brother, before you bring your sacrifice to the altar, you need to leave that sacrifice there and you need to go and reconcile to that brother. What he's saying is, is don't bring your worship to me because your mind is not on it. So, understand this. We've all struggled with forgiveness. Maybe someone in the church has hurt us. Maybe they've sinned against us. Maybe they've said something we didn't agree with that hurt our feelings or something along those lines. And so, we don't reconcile through the aspect of what forgiveness is that brings us to reconciliation and we hold on to that, brethren. And believe it or not, it affects our worship. It affects the way in which we pay attention and focus our thoughts and our minds and our hearts to God as He wants us to. John 4 and verse 24, right? That we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, God seeks or desires those that are going to worship Him as God says according to His Word. So as we're bringing our gift, that means we're bringing ourselves to God concerning our worship. If our heart is not in the right place because we have something against someone by which we're holding on to because we're angry at that person, brethren, you cannot worship God according to His truth or His standards. But we struggle with this because it's difficult. It's hard for us. Again, Jesus said, if you have ought against someone, then go to that person. But that person says, you know what, Larry? They're the ones who hurt me. They need to come to me. Uh Uh-uh, that's not the way it works. Though we think it does, that's not the way it works. You recall what Jesus says in Mark chapter 11 and verse 26. If you stand praying to God, if you have ought against someone, forgive that person. Yeah, but yeah, Larry, I understand that. But, but if I go over to Luke chapter 17 and verse 3, it says, If a brother sins against you and he repents, then forgive him. So, so I know that he's got to repent to come to me, does he? But Jesus just said, If you have ought against someone as you stand praying to God, forgive that person. Brethren, what we have to realize is that forgiveness first through the process of what it means is for me. You see, it relates to my relationship with God because if I have something against someone who sinned against me, my relationship is now affected and I can't focus on God the way that I should. And so we have the idea of forgiveness and then we have the idea of reconciliation. The two are related, but at the same time they're different. You see, forgiveness is the aspect or the the idea by which I forgive you of the hurt that you cause me so that it doesn't affect my relationship with God. Because we've all been there, right? You've been angry with someone, someone who's hurt you deeply, who's cut to the core, someone who's cost you or has caused you grief. And so you stew over it, it causes you anxiety, maybe even gives you a little depression. You have to take antacids because it's causing you such turmoil within your body that it physically affects you, that you can't do anything about it because you have so much hate towards the individual that you literally can't sleep. Maybe you've been there. And so we stew over it and we think about it. And all the while we're thinking or looking at the person, thinking, you know, they should know better. But here's the question. What if the person doesn't know that they even caused me any pain or grief or hurt? What if they don't know they've done anything to me in the first place? You see, so now my relationship is being affected by the simple fact by which I think that person might have offended me, but it's causing me inner turmoil, and I'm not going to let it go, so therefore it affects my relationship. And brethren, I've seen such things cause rifts in the Lord's body, so much so that it splits churches. But again, if forgiveness wasn't hard, Peter wouldn't have struggled with it like he did. If I can go back to Matthew chapter 18, which is where we're going to focus our attention this morning. If, if I'm looking at the particular account in which Jesus is addressing the idea of forgiveness, Peter is struggling with this. You see, Peter, being a chosen one of God, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. But you see, sometimes I know we elevate apostles through the Bible because we understand these men had such a great responsibility as being the inner circle of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, they were regular people just like you and I. And so when we think about the idea of forgiveness, Peter, being a human being, struggling with his humanity, 
doesn't understand the thought process that goes into what it means to truly forgive someone that's transgressed against you. Because what does he say? Lord, how many times do I got to forgive this person? Seven times? You see, Jesus, here's what I want you to do. I need you to give me a number. Because after that, I'm done with this person. I'm through with them continually offending me and hurting me and causing me grief over and over and over again. I'm tired of this, so Lord, give me a number so I can cut this person off. Brethren, thank God He didn't do that because you and I would not have a chance in eternity. Because you see, there is no limit to God's love as it relates to forgiveness and reconciliation. When we come into God's presence, into His love, into His fold, into His family, God is telling us that I've got you. I know you're going to make a mistake because you're a human being, but here's the thing. God offers us a way always to come back home, doesn't He? Yes, He does. Why? Because that's the idea of what agapao means concerning the biblical term of love. Love, through the aspect of agapao, simply means that I am willing to give the best of what love defines itself to be to you and put myself in the background. Well, isn't that what he did with Jesus at Calvary? That he put Jesus Christ up on the cross of Calvary, removed himself from the situation and says, He now has to die for your sins. Because we know as the Hebrew writer says, the blood of bull and goats could not take away sin. And so because I can now be reconciled to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiveness is possible. But when we think about the idea of Peter struggling with this concept, Lord, how many times do I have to keep doing this? Please tell me because this is really getting old. Maybe perhaps you've been there. Maybe this person continues to hurt you over and over again. Maybe you've forgiven this loved one. Maybe it's a child that you've forgiven, but they continue to hurt you and, and do the same thing over and over again. And you're thinking to yourself, why do I have to put up with this? Why do I have to continue to tolerate this behavior? Because you wear the name of Christian. You see, as difficult as that might be, Jesus then goes on to explain, not literally, but figuratively, when He says 70 times 7, 490 times, Jesus wasn't being serious. What He's saying is, Peter, there's no limit to what forgiveness is. If that brother comes to you again, as He says in Luke chapter 17 and verse 3, and that brother asks for forgiveness, and if he repents, then you forgive him. But if he doesn't, then it says to rebuke him. Rebuke is an aspect by which we understand forgiveness to be too. You see, rebuke is the, the, the idea of, of also being able to go to the person and say, you know what, you did hurt me. You know, what you did to me hurt me, of which I might say, you know what, brother, uh, sister, I'm sorry, I had no idea. I had no idea that what I said caused you any grief or that it stirred up some kind of emotion or that you thought that was an intentional. Certainly that wasn't the case. You know, brethren, majority of the time that's generally what it is. Now that's not to say the hurt isn't there. But let's understand forgiveness. Forgiveness is my part of the equation. Forgiveness is how I then come to understand what it means to truly be forgiven. You see, forgiveness is about me giving up the hurt that I feel towards the person that sinned against me. You see, forgiveness is about me removing the debt that you now owe me. But reconciliation is you paying for the debt or then coming into that relationship and the idea of what reconciliation is. So what I'm saying is that I'm allowing myself to no longer be hurt by your actions. As Jesus says, again in Mark 11 and verse 26, if you, have, if you stand praying to God, think about that. And, the, and the, the idea of how important it is as we're talking to God. As we're praying to the Father in heaven, He says, don't you let anything come between you and me when you're talking to me. You need to remove everything out of your mind and out of the situation that's going to affect how you're going to talk to me and what we're going to discuss here and what, or rather what you're going to ask for and the blessings and all of those things that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails. And so God says you need to remove all of those things. So if you have ought against a brother, then you forgive him before you pray to me. So you see what I'm doing is I'm allowing myself to forgive. But it doesn't mean that the hurt's not there. 
You see, sometimes that's where people get confused. They think is, if I come to you and if I hurt you, and, and I ask for forgiveness, and certainly we understand the concept of trying to remove and forget those things, that's a, a good idea, that's a good thought, but it's easier said than done, isn't it? If someone's really hurt you to your core, if they've really hurt you bad, and they've caused you endless nights of, 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 of no sleep and pain and anguish, you see, that person doesn't get a free pass because they hurt you. People have this idea, well, now that I'm forgiven, you need to get over it. You need to just move on from it. Ah, oh, brother, it don't work that way. Because if someone causes you so much grief and pain and anguish, that doesn't just fade into the past. You know, we understand that God, because He is the God, He is our God, that He can choose to forget the sins that we've committed against Him. Micah 7.19 says, His, Our sins will He cast into the depths of the sea. What He's saying is, God is going to put up a no fishing sign, and He's not going to allow anyone to go digging for the sins that I committed against Him, because God has forgiven me. And that's the only person I'm worried about. But what forgiveness does is it allows me to begin to heal. Forgiveness allows me to forget about the sin that you've committed, but brethren, the hurt is still there. The hurt is still going to continue to linger until reconciliation begins its process. And so forgiveness is simply the first step in the process to be reconciled to the person that's caused me the grief. So if I stand praying to God, I want to ensure that my relationship is reflective of what it needs to be. And so now that I can forgive this person that's caused me this grief and, and this anguish and all of these emotions that I'm feeling, because emotions simply have to be defined by the feelings that we have. You see, emotions don't have a tagline. How we describe emotions, what our body's going through, when we say, I feel angry, we're describing an emotion. I feel hurt, we're describing an emotion. That's the working memory in our brain that's telling us, hey, this is what your body is going through right now. This is what you're feeling because of what the person has done to you. And though now I'm going to allow myself the process by which I can be what, forgiving to the person that's hurt me. And then I can begin to decide whether or not the reconciliation process is going to take place at that moment. Again, sometimes we as Christians think that because this forgiveness has to take place, if I come to you and ask for forgiveness, you've got to forgive me right now and let's move on and we're done with it. <laughs> Again, brother, it doesn't work that way. You see, reconciliation can be defined as bringing in a, an estranged person back into a relationship. And so again, 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with God. And His blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So what that is, is because I've been estranged from God as a Christian, God is now going to allow me to be reconciled back to Him to mend the relationship. And so if someone transgresses against me or hurts me, then I get to forgive the person, but now the reconciliation process has to begin. Forgiveness is my part. Reconciliation is their part. So it's their responsibility to come to me to be reconciled. And so the reconciliation process begins to take place, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to be guarded or have a wall up to not allow myself to be hurt by that person again. Brethren, sometimes in the church we have this misconception of this idea that hurt is automatically removed, emotions are simply taken out of the way, and now we can just walk together like nothing ever happened. Pray tell if you've ever been hurt or sinned against that you've been able to do that because I have not. I've had brethren in the church hurt me. I've had brethren say things about me in the church that were not true, but that hurt me to my core. But at the same time, here's the thing I also remember. Your choice to sin against me is not going to affect my relationship with God. Because if I choose to hold all of that hate and all of that discontent and vitriol towards an individual, especially their brother in Christ, I'm in jeopardy of losing my own soul. So how important then is it to me? Again, we talked about in Bible class the aspect of, of love towards each other. Jesus said, Brethren, by this shall all men know that you're my disciple if you have love one for another. 
The concept of salvation is based upon the idea of what love is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 And so God loved us enough to give us His Son. Jesus said, if you love me, John 14, 15, then you're going to keep my commandments. So, based upon my relationship with God, because I love Him, I'm going to do these things. Why? Not because I have to, but because I want to, because I love Jesus. And so, if you and I have an issue, and if I've sinned against you, then I need to be reconciled to you because I love you, but also at the same time, I need to allow myself to know that this isn't going to be an easy conversation. You see, sometimes we think simply we can wipe this under the carpet and therefore we can just move on and we don't have to discuss it. Brother, that's not the way this thing works. If I go to Matthew chapter 18, again, as we're talking about, Jesus gives this idea of what forgiveness is concerning, believe it or not, there's this thing in the business world, they call it conflict resolution. But you know, I can go all the way back to the Bible and Jesus talked about that too. So beginning in verse 15, it said, Moreover, for brother trespasses against thee, and go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear you, then you've gained a brother. So there's this idea of resolving the conflict. You see, here's, here's an idea. You've caused me this pain, so I can go to you and say, Look, here's the thing. And the person will say, You know what? I'm sorry that I did that. And there I've gained, you, gained a brother in Christ. Right? That, that relationship is repaired. But again, it doesn't mean the hurt is not there. Verse 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take, it, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now, let me explain to you how this, this works, because sometimes we get this wrong. You see, if I have an issue with John, I don't get to go to, to Ron or one of the other elders and say, listen, y'all ain't going to believe what John did to me. John stole my fishing pole, and I need my fishing pole back. And I begin to, to, to lambast John to the elders to get them on my side because I want them to chastise John for what he did. That's not the way it works. You see, if I have ought against John and we've talked and we can't come to, to, to a, an agreeable understanding or that we can't be reconciled to each other, then I can go to the elders and say, look, John and I are having some problems. Can you please come and witness this? So as we talk, maybe I'm in the wrong here. Maybe I'm the one who needs to ask for forgiveness here, but can you come as a neutral party and sit and listen to the problem? That's what Jesus is talking about there. I've had brethren, they'll come to me and say, Larry, brother, sister, so-and-so did this, and you need to fix this, and you need to tell them. I'm like, ah, uh -uh, that ain't the way this works. But then Jesus said, if that doesn't work, then you tell it to the church. You tell it to the congregation. If they still will not hear you, then they're cast off, they're withdrawn from, they're considered to be heathens. So there's this ample opportunity for restoration to take place. But you see, Peter still was confused with that. But here's one thing I also want you to know too in verse 20 that sometimes people get wrong or the world misunderstands. Where it says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Brethren, that has nothing to do with worship. What Jesus is saying here, if we understand the context of this verse, he's just talked about conflict resolution. Now he says, if you're reconciled to that brother in Christ, I'm walking with you together as one. So where two or three are gathered in my name, he says, there I am in the midst of you. So you're reconciled together. But then, as we just mentioned, Peter says, but Lord, how many times do I have to keep doing this? But then Jesus, as... As wonderful as he was and able to expound upon these things, he always used moments like this to be teachable. And so Jesus, beginning in verse 23, uses a parable in this situation. He says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which had to take an account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents, which really is maybe about three months' worth of wages during that time. Or rather, 30 years' worth of wages, excuse me meaning that he probably wasn't going to be able to pay this off. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children so that payment could be remitted to the king. So think about this. The debt was so large that he couldn't pay it back. The king says, I'm going to get my money. But notice what happens here. It says, the servant fell down on his face and worshipped him saying, Lord, and this is a key, key word here to remember, Lord, have patience with me. 
I want you to remember that word. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, remember that word, and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But here's the thing, obviously he didn't understand how great that debt was and certainly the gift that was given to him because this debt was forgiven. Verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence, so just a few months worth of wages, and laid his hands on him, literally physically taking a hold of this individual and says, give me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me. Now, he just asked for patience to be forgiven of a debt of which he could never pay back. And now another servant, one of his fellow brethren, comes to him because he owes such a small debt. And he says, hey, I need you to have some patience with me. And I promise you I'm going to pay this back. But it said he would not. And when he went and cast him into the debtor's prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they felt sorry for him. And they went back to the king and said, guess what your servant did? And it said, Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, Thou wicked servant, I forgave you of that debt because you desired it of me. Shouldn't you have also had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? So think about Jesus and what God did for us through the cross of Calvary and and how He was willing to pay a debt for something of which we could never pay back. Brethren, there's not a person in this room that could pay back the debt that Jesus Christ gave to us. Not one. But He said, because of that, I had pity on you, and you in turn can't go to your own brother and offer forgiveness for something they did to transgress against you? Brethren, think about that for a moment. We demand forgiveness from God. We expect it from God. Why? Because that's what Christianity is. That's what we understand it to be, right? Forgiveness is the idea by which we know salvation is given. I have to be forgiven to receive eternity. Revelation 2.10 tells me to receive eternity. I must be faithful. And because of that, here the individual says, I want my money. And the master says, you couldn't even have compassion or patience with this person. So what does he do? He sells him and throws him into debtor's prison. So, brethren, the idea that here we have the greatest gift given to mankind by the greatest man who ever give, had, you know, lived, and we can't even forgive a fellow brother or sister in Christ when they transgress against us, brethren, that ought not to be the case. But you see, forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness is hard. That's why it's a biblical concept. But we also have to understand how we repair those relationships also affect our relationship with God. When I think about this idea of forgiveness, when I was in preaching school several years ago, my instructor and I was sitting on the front row, not because I was a goody two-shoes, but because that's where the air conditioning controller was, because it was cooler in class. My instructor handed me a letter, and he said, Larry, I want you to read this letter to the class. So I didn't really pay attention to the outside of the envelope, so I opened up the letter and I began to read the letter. And he said, hello, Brother Elkins. My name is Jeff. And he said, currently I'm serving several life sentences for murder. He says, and I recently came across one of your tracks on baptism. And as I was reading through this particular track, and I'm paraphrasing this letter. I didn't have it to memory. As I came across your particular track, I found your address, so I chose to write you there. And I was wondering, if you think about all of the horrible things that I've done, Is there any way that I can be forgiven because of what I've done? Signed, Jeffrey Dahmer. Of which, Brother Elkins responded and wrote back to him saying, 100% absolutely. Now, here's the thing. Was he forgiven in baptism? 100%. God tells us in in Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 8, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. But brethren, that does not mean he was not going to continue to pay for the consequences of his sins on this earth. You see, when we think about what sin can do to us and how it can hurt, it doesn't mean there's repercussions to our actions, or rather those repercussions aren't going to be removed. They're still going to be there. But at the same time, it also doesn't mean that we can't be forgiven of the sins that we commit against God. So yes, brethren, forgiveness is a difficult thing. But brethren, for us to truly 
shine like Jesus. And we're talking about encounters with Jesus this week. Sometimes we have to encounter Jesus again to understand what that true love looks like. Today, you can experience that same true love through forgiveness if you're not a Christian. But you see, that's the decision you have to make. You have to choose to be reconciled to God based upon the forgiveness He's willing to offer you because of Jesus' sacrifice. When I think about John 15 and verse 13, probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, greater love hath no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. Think about that for a moment. Lay down his life for a friend. Jesus called me friend. Rather than there's no greater friend that you can have on this earth than Jesus Christ himself. So today, if you're not a Christian and you want to experience that friendship and that love, then I encourage you through what you've heard in belief that you choose to make that decision tonight. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make in your life because it concerns your eternity. You see, through obedience, we are willing to recognize and confess with our mouth unto salvation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We're also willing to repent of our sins. Repentance is the idea by which we recognize sin. These people say, well, repentance is about the heart. No, it's not. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, Proverbs, 22, or, uh, Proverbs 23 and verse 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Repentance is about the idea of recognizing the sin, which brings about the change of action, that I'm no longer going to do that thing. Because Jesus says in Luke 13 and verse 3, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So repentance is important, but repentance allows me to realize what I must do now to have those sins washed away in baptism, Acts 2.38. Think about uh, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, The like figure went to baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. So in, in baptism, all of my sins are removed. And guess what? I become this new creature in Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4, wherefore I'm raised to walk as a new person. I get a new set of clothes. But here's the thing that we have to remember. Because we are imperfect beings serving a perfect person, we can make mistakes. And as Christians, we can be reconciled back to God when we make mistakes. But maybe it is the case that you're here this morning and you're struggling with forgiveness. Maybe it's the case this morning that you have something or an ought ought against a brother or sister in Christ that you haven't been reconciled with. Brethren, can I encourage you to take care of that before it's everlasting too late? The Bible tells us in James 4 and verse 14 that what is your life but a bud of vapor that appears a little time and then vanishes away. We know how quickly life can go. So before it's too late, why not do that today as together we stand?